比赛有输有赢。人生有他，一定会赢。Life changes. Jesus' love, however, does not. I saw every single axe how they killed my father. He from 死人堆里面爬出来 I think it took me about half an hour or so to get rid of dead bodies over me. 长大之后，佢翻去揾杀死佢父母嘅凶手 I could feel that his body was more like a vibration. He's so shaky. 位于柬埔寨嵌粒市嘅吴哥窟，除咗有令人赞叹嘅美景之外，亦都被联合国教科文组织列入世界文化遗产，系柬埔寨人引以为傲嘅地方。就连柬埔寨国旗亦都以呢个地方做标志。从吴哥窟，我哋可以睇到柬埔寨曾经辉煌嘅历史，而从柬埔寨嘅历史，亦都令我哋了解到呢个国家曾经发生令人震惊嘅事。从一九七五至到一九七九年，赤柬三年零八个月嘅执政期间，柬埔寨共产党以暴力强制手段清洗城市，并且展开全国大屠杀。喺唔到四年嘅时间里面，柬埔寨全国近四分之一嘅人口，大约二百万人被屠杀，遍野哀鸿，举世震惊。人民嘅鲜血流遍全国各地，系柬埔寨人至今都难以忘记嘅噩梦。新灰山正系呢次大屠杀里面嘅幸存者。虽然佢当时只系一个小朋友，但系佢仍然深刻记得当时嘅情况。One early morning, I went fishing with my younger brother. On my way back home, I saw Khmeru's shoulder. There were sharp knives and axes and sword blades. There was a young teenager came to my house and inviting my father for for a meeting. There I saw they arrest my father. They bound his arm backwards, and then my father confronted. What is wrong with me? One of them responded to him that today we will destroy you. And、uh, when I saw that, I was so frightened and ran back home, trying to hold on to my younger brother and sister. I could tell that that moment, four of us tried to embrace each other, but the fear of being killed was so terrible. We could hardly stand still. We were so shaky, so tremble. Suddenly, soldier came to my house, arrest me. They brought my arm backward. By then, I had almost like two years old baby brother. They decided to release me and allow me to carry my baby brother, put him on oxen cart, and drove to the jungle with a lot of kids and a professor and other teacher. So I think about when we got to the jungle, about 15 minutes prior to the killing. That time, they were digging the grave, which not ready for us. I got off from ox carts and、uh, carried my baby brother to to my father. Look through his eyes. I could tell that my father was absolutely broken. Sorry. Somehow he forced himself to say a few good words. One of the words he said was that I love you. In in our culture, we suddenly practice word ball affection. That was my first time and my last time. I remember my father said, "It really means a lot to my life." By the time they finished、uh, the grave, they took my father first, 
And he turned back. He said that we will come together and we will go together as a family. They make him kneel down in front of the grave, try to kneel down, they bust him from behind, fall into the pits. He will scream, kicking. A soldier jump in, try to butcher him. So I saw every single axe how they killed my father. Uh, professor was there, he tried to run away from that. They trip him down, he's screaming, they clapped at him, scrapped his feet, threw him to the pit. A lot of kids were screaming. It's my turn then. I carried my baby brother to the grave, laid him on my left side, and knelt down. Someone bust me from behind. I was falling on the pit. Then I heard they clapped my baby brother at least four or five times. The first three times I could hear his scream was so loud. All I could remember was that there's a lot of body was falling over me. Blood comes through my nose and my mouth and uh, I could hardly breathe. I thought I would finish. But then, they tried to bury. I could feel the soil topping in my body. When they tried to bury and then someone said, don't bury yet, there's some more enemies need to be finished in this place. He went to pick up my mother, my sister, and other women who went to work in the farm early mornings. I think it took me about half an hour or so to get rid of the dead bodies over me. I didn't know what to do. At that time, I was just a kid. I was so young to understand. I just lie on dead bodies, waiting for them to come to finish me. While I was lying there, I saw the bird coming into graves. For some reason, I was so disturbed by that, and I picked up a piece of wood straight at the bird. And the bird come back three times. And every time when the bird lies the grave, I observed that the bird flew only one direction, which is eastward of the grave. If I were to look from, from my own perspective right now, I believe the Holy Spirit sent the bird to save my life. So I climbed on the grave and move on to the east direction of the birds. Then about five or six minutes or so, I saw they were tracking my mother, my sister, and all the women approaching from the west side of the grave. You know what, if I were to stay there three to five more minutes, I would encounter them. There I saw they killed my mother, my sister, and other women. After they finished killing 33 people in that day, they were not aware that I was alive. Then they went back to the village. I went back to the grave. I think I cried, I screamed until I lost consciousness. The trauma was so powerful that took over my life and I could not cope with that. I made three promises in my life. The first one I, that I made was I wanted to take revenge from my family. If I could not fulfill the first one, I wanted to dedicate my life to be a Buddhist monk. And the last promise that I made was that if I could not fulfill the first two promises, I would like to go far, far away from Cambodia. And then I went back to live in the village and then I found uh, the man in the village tried to help me to uh, escape all of that. Anyway, it's a long journey that I survived. By 1979, and then I uh, returned back to live with my auntie returned back to live in a city, and then I went to school. It, it was so difficult for me to cope with my study. And that time I suffered what we call post-traumatic stress disorder. Unfortunately, no one in the society understanding how I went through mentally, emotionally and psychologically. And uh, it was so difficult for me to cope with that. Nightmares, flashback, and anxiety and uh, feeling insecure and it was so difficult to live with that uh, PTSD. Uh, however, uh, I strive my best to cope with my study. Uh, when I complete my study, I decided to join the police force. My desire to become a policeman was very simple, uh, that I, so that I could return back to that village with a gun in my hands. 
I want to suck their blood. I want to take revenge. I was absolutely determined to take revenge. Before I reached the village, I met a farmer there and he said that there was a lot of Khmer Rouge soldiers there. I was not convinced. However, I sent one of my men as a spy and to check it. And he came back, he said, Rexa, there was a lot of Khmer Rouge soldiers there. I could not go to the village. I know the Khmer Rouge soldiers, they were good in fighting. So I returned back home. I was just filled with depression, guilty, anger, disappointment, bitterness. And uh, it was so difficult to live with that. Every evening I need to drink so that I could fall asleep. Going to bed is almost like hell for me. Flashback, nightmares and uh, all kinds of things that's, that's, that's so difficult for me to cope with it. I think uh, at that time I was a policeman, I was not allowed to become a Buddhist monk. It was communist and uh, religious does not exist in a society, which means that I could not fulfill my second promise. The first promise is the second promise. So uh, finally, I tried to uh, fulfill my last promise, which was to escape from Cambodia to Thailand. I was a very silly guy, and I went through, uh, I got a few friends who, who went with me to Thailand uh, through the uh, the borders and uh, the jungle. We walk in the jungle for two days and two nights. Before I reached uh, the camps, there was a bad guy, so I didn't know it was Khmer Rouge soldier or Khmer resistant or whoever, I didn't know. When they saw us, they shoot at us. And uh, being a policeman, I know how to run. So I got off by myself and I run and run. I think I ran about a few hours. When I was running there, I saw a lot of dead bodies in the jungle. But I could not figure out why and how and what. I just kept running and running and running and running. So when I got out of that, I saw three men from a far distance. And I ran toward them. I could see that they tried to make a sign like this, which was, they tried to tell me, stop running, stop running. When I got to them, they asked me, where you come from? So I told them I was being chased and somebody used to shoot at me a few hours ago, I just kept running. And one of them said that that was impossible. Then I asked him why. He said that I ran through mines field. There were at least two million landmines on the ground. No one ever come out of that jungle alive. So after I heard that, I almost had a heart attack, you know. And I was just, oh my goodness. So they took me to the camp. And then uh, by uh, 1985, I was able to get to uh, refugee camp in Thailand. When I was in the camp, I was able to uh, correspond with my cousin who lived in California. And I wrote to him and he wrote me back and told me the person named Jesus. So I wrote him back that your Jesus cannot buy food. I need a real US dollar to buy food, not Jesus. Send me the money. Well, they keep telling me Jesus did that. Anyway, uh, when I was in a camp, my biggest dream was that, that one day I would be able to go to live in California to start life again. Unfortunately, after waiting there for five years, I was rejected by INS, which means I was not allowed to go to live in California with my cousin. And that time, I realized that I found the greatest enemy of my life. It was hopelessness. What was the point of living with hopelessness? There's nowhere to go. And uh, it was so difficult for me to, to, to live that. At that time, I started going to church from time to time, but my heart was not there yet. And I, one evening, I got out of my house and knelt down. I said my prayer. I said, God, if you take me to Canada to start my new life again, I will give my life to you. So uh, May 15, 1989, at 3 o'clock, I arrived at Toronto International Airport. 
I wouldn't have forgot uh, my prayer when I was in a camp. So when I got to Canada, the first thing I was looking for was the Bible. I think by then, I realized that I want to uh, follow the Lord. And I went to church and start my uh, uh, Bible study. And then I went to study it at Ontario Bible College. It was OBC then. At that point, it was still very traumatized and very troubled and, and trying to sort through the things that had happened to him. When I found out who Rexa was and what it went into this guy, and I remember being shocked and just amazed at how this really warm and delightful person um, had gone through so much. That in those years, there were several times that Rexa confided that he was having physical problems and sleeping problems and knowing that there still was some suffering going on. And it was in the early years of him sorting this all out and finding healing and, and trying to understand what, how God allowed this kind of suffering and incorporating it with his Christian faith and all of that. I returned back to to the village where my father was killed and to meet my family killer. That time when they killed my family, six of them was involved in killing my family. Only two survived. So I went to see the guy who killed my father. Uh, the guy also killed my mother. I mean, at the first time I feel nervous too. So scared, you know. What is going to happen, you know? And he just went, I mean, a few people and people who uh, use like cruel during that time. So I'm so scared for him. It's easy to say I forgive you from Canada to Cambodia, but in reality, standing in front of a man that took my family forever away to say I forgive you, that was absolutely painful in my life. I offered him a camel scar to put on his shoulder. I said, this is a symbol of my forgiveness for you. Then I gave him my shirt, a symbol of my love for you. And the Bible, the symbol of my blessing for you. After that, I gave him a hug. When I hugged him, I could feel that his body almost like a vibration. He's so shaky. I said to him, 28 years ago, when you took my family to the jungle, this is how I felt. But today, I came back as ambassador of Jesus Christ. It is set you free. And then I went to see the guy who killed my mother. I went to look for him in three different times, different village. Nobody was willing to tell me. Finally, I met his wife. She broke down and weeped and cried. And she said, please don't kill my husband. So I went to, uh, to see, well, she trusted me. She told me and I went to see him and sit down and talk to him. So I did the same thing. I offered him a Campbell scars, a symbol of my forgiveness for him, the shirt, a symbol of my love, and the Bible, a symbol of my blessing for him. And I would sit down and talk, and then he said that why your God is so good that help you to forgive. You need to realize that I was given order to kill your family. If I did not do it, they would kill me. But you know what? I was wrong. And when he said, will you forgive me? The moment I heard that, I just broke down, I wept, I cried. I cried in the sense that I had accomplished one of the most difficult missions in my life, which was to forgive my family killer. I actually set myself free. Sun 
。佢知道透过上帝嘅爱，佢能够饶恕，并且系得着释放嘅生命。亦都因为上帝嘅爱，佢决定放弃加拿大舒适嘅生活，留低落嚟服侍柬埔寨人。The schools stand as a symbol of my forgiveness to the people there. You know what? If I were to return back to that village as a policeman, there would be a killing field in that village. But thankfully, God prevented me not to go back when I was a policeman, and I returned back as ambassador of Jesus Christ. I brought light into the darkness. Then I built a school there, and five of the kids come from the guy who killed my father. Family study there. I think last year I heard that one of the students who went to that school study to become a medical doctor. It was overjoyed for me to hear that. It was a very primitive culture because at that school now the girl had a chance to become a medical doctor one day. So it was, I think, for me it, it's a joy to hear that. 除咗兴建学校同年轻一代同行之外，新辉山亦都身体力行，运用佢心理学嘅专业，帮助一班曾经受过创伤嘅柬埔寨人，希望呢一班人能够好似佢一样喺上帝嘅爱里边得到医治。That was Rex's gift of reconciliation to the village and to those people. That, that Um, yeah, how do you account for that except for saying it's a work of God in Rex's life? It's just an amazing, amazing work of God. It's really incredible to see it. The things that God has done in him are miraculous. Not just the miracles that happened with the circumstances surrounding the killings, but the the miracle of who he's become and and his his love for his people. He said, "I want to be buried with my people. I want to retire and be buried in Cambodia." And we were shocked. That was a different Rex, and that tells you the depth that his walk with God has gone, and how much that healing is genuine. He's not going back there with the fear and trepidation of bringing healing or forgiveness because he thought he had to. Now it comes out of saying. No, you know what? These were my people, and they are my people, and I will live with them, and I will die with them. I, that I found that really moving. That's a change, I, and I don't know when that happened, and I don't know if he was able to articulate that either. But that's that's new. 回望自己嘅经历，新辉晒俾自己一个总结。There's no freedom in life if I don't forgive. Because of that conviction in my life, I learned to forgive. Forgiveness is not how I set a person free. I actually set myself free. A lot of the misconception of the forgiveness, people tend to say that I forgive you, I let you go, I've set you free. That's not real. You forgive, you actually set yourself free. In my case, when I forgive, I set myself free. But it's not easy. I don't want to just tell people that you forgive you, you wake up one morning, you wake up, I go forgive. No, it's not that. It's a long, painful process, but I know in my heart, by the grace of God, I set myself free. Yes, you did. Since Fuisa willingly follows the teaching of God to encourage others, he will be able to get the freedom of the soul and live a true freedom. If you want to get the freedom of the soul, please come and join us in the Inu Life Church. Please visit us at our website at www.inuchurch.org.nz.www.inuchurch.org.nz.www.inuchurch.org.nz.www.inuchurch.org.nz.www.inuchurch.org.nz.www.inuchurch.org.nz.www.inuchurch.org.nz.www.inuchurch.org
滴滴恩雨，滋润普世华人心灵。恩雨之声，以世界各地华人经历耶稣基督带嚟生命改变嘅真实故事，透过全球电视同埋电台广播网络，仲有电脑互联网广传福音，亦都以生命关顾电话热线帮助有需要嘅人。我哋嘅事工好需要你经济上嘅支持，就让我哋继续为福音齐心努力。